science on surfaces, a bigger perspective on the small. Welcome to this podcast, Science on Surfaces, a bigger perspective on the small. Uh, here we zoom in on science that impacts our everyday lives. And today we will talk about climate change and how this is related to the energy system. And we'll also talk about the relevance of surface science in this context. My name is Malin Edvardsson, and here with me in the studio I have Professor Bengt Cosimo. You are Professor of Physics at Chalmers University of Technology. Welcome. Thank you very much. So you have a long experience in surface science, and you're also very much involved in sustainable energy and the energy systems of the future, and their significance of climate change. And uh, uh, climate change and global warming are topics that are uh, intensely discussed these days. And I feel that the intensity of these discussions are increasing. And so in 2015, we had the Paris Agreement, which was an agreement within uh, the United Framework, United Nations Framework Convention uh, on Climate Change, and where uh, it was agreed that we shall keep the increase in global average temperature to well below uh, two degrees above pre-industrial levels. And then last year, uh, we had what you could, to simplify it a bit, um, call a follow-up meeting, uh, where the intention was to agree on the how, like what actions can we take to reach uh, the goals of uh, the Paris Agreement. And so we are all aware that we have to take some actions. Uh, and we'll soon discuss uh, who can and should act, and, and particularly in relation to the energy system. Uh, but first, let's start with some basic definitions um, on concepts and terminology. So, for example, the climate. What is uh, the climate? Climate is the conditions on, on the globe, on the Earth, in terms of uh, temperature, winds, uh, uh, temperature variations over long t time scales. Mm. Climate is very different from weather. Weather can change from one day to the other. Mm. Climate changes from one maybe decade to the other or century to the other. Mm. And it's only a climate change is only really ascertained if, if we see changes over very long time periods. Mm. Okay. So what can cause climate change? There's a lot of things that can cause climate change that are, and we talk about man-induced climate change, and we, there are natural, mm -hmm. uh, so-called natural climate changes, and changes in, uh, for example, sea currents, in air currents, in uh, even in solar activity, mm -hmm. volcano eruptions, and so on, can cause climate change. Mm -hmm without man being really involved. Mm -hmm. But the focus in the discussion today is on man-induced changes. Mm -hmm. And the, the very the totally dominating factor there is uh, CO2, carbon dioxide emissions from fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. uh, when I started working on energy questions, climate was very rarely mentioned talking about 20 30 years back yeah the whole focus was on how to supply energy the day oil and coal and gas will <coughs> diminish the, the reserves will have been used up mm -hmm. today the focus is not on, on that at all it is on how can we reduce the use of fossil fuels in order to reduce co2 emissions in order to reduce temperature change, mm -hmm. which affect the climate. And what is the relation between CO2 emission and temperature change? The relation is that the more CO2 we have in the atmosphere, the more will we increase the temperature because it acts as a filter, mm -hmm. allowing more energy to come in to the earth. Mm -hmm and less energy to be radiated out. No, not more, but it's almost 
doesn't affect the mm. radiation into the earth, mm. but it reduces the the radiation out from the earth, the infrared, and that depends on the different wavelengths for the incoming radiation and the outgoing radiation. The outgoing radiation is infrared. Mm -hmm and it's effectively stopped by carbon dioxide. Mm. And the infrared is then heat? The infrared is heat, you yeah. could say. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and what you're talking about now it is what is referred to as the greenhouse effect. That's the greenhouse effect. So yeah. the, the CO2 shield that we have around all around the globe mm -hmm. acts as a greenhouse in the sense that radiation comes in, mm. warms up, mm -hmm. And, and most a lot of the heat radiation out is stopped by yeah. carbon dioxide so and the trapped. temperature rises. Yeah, yeah. okay. Okay, um, also, I mean, now you talked about CO2 and sometimes we talk about the greenhouse gases. Um, so what is the difference between those two? <clears throat> the difference is that there are more greenhouse gases, very powerful greenhouse gases than CO2. But CO2 is a totally dominating uh, in terms of amount, mm -hmm. so far at least. Mm -hmm. The other, uh, for, for example, one is methane. Mm -hmm. Methane is actually more powerful than CO2, but there is much less methane uh, emitted. So therefore C the focus is on CO2 and the CO2 that comes from fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. And where can methane come from? Methane can come from, uh, for example, various fermentation processes from agriculture. Sometimes cows are blamed for yeah. <laughs> emitting C methane. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Potentially, the, the worst source of methane is in what is called clathrates. It's um, methane that is bound in the permafrost. Okay. And there's a lot of methane bound there in the permafrost. So, yeah. so if temperature co increases, the climate mm. global warming yeah, occurs, yeah. Yeah. then <coughs> th this permafrost may melt and yeah. release methane. Okay. So there is a connection between the two that where s too much CO2 may raise the temperature and the t raising temperature may raise emission of methane. Yeah, okay so-called clathrates. Okay, so that will be that would be really bad then. It, it's a, like a self-accelerating effect. Yeah, okay. Okay, so we and need... The, and a very important key or, or fact in this discussion is that <coughs> the focus on CO2 is so <coughs> strong because the globe, the, the world is to 80% depending on fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. The energy supply mm -hmm. is to 80% about, mm -hmm. depending on fossil. Mm -hmm. And that's where we, s that's the starting point. So if we continue to use so much fossil fuels mm -hmm. uh, that it's 80% <coughs> of the energy consumption, mm -hmm. we will spit out lots and lots of CO2 and we will exceed the temperature goal Mm. by far. Yeah. So therefore the focus is on CO2 and the main to, to mention two main areas it's the transport cars airplanes and so on which is totally depending on dependent on fossils mm. and the other is electricity production for example in Sweden we don't think so much about it because we think Electricity is produced by green sources like uh, hydroelectric and nuclear and wind and so on. Mm -hmm. But globally, mm -hmm. more than 50% of the electricity comes from fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this, this um, brings me sort of back to me as a consumer. Mm -hmm. um, so we're talking about the energy system and uh, as a consumer you may may think like oh what can I do what should I do and the advice is really abundant and I found a list online there are several lists online um, but one list uh, that said seven ways to reduce your carbon footprint and it lists these seven bullet points then so eat less meat unplug your electronic devices drive less 
don't buy fast fashion, plant a garden, eat locally grown foods, and line dry your clothes. And if you just read this list, it's maybe not obvious how this is related to the energy system uh, that you talked about, but of course, mm. this is connected to everything. Like you mm. said, electricity, um, transportation, and so on. Um, so, but when you talk about the energy system, wh what is this? It sounds like an infrastructure almost. It is an infrastructure and it's um, usually one tries to define the energy system through its components and starting at the source, it's the source of like fossil fuels, mm -hmm. like oil, 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 oil well, wells and carbon mines and so on. That's where you have the source. Mm -hmm. And then you have to, uh, you have to harvest this source and you have to process it. Mm -hmm. For example, oil sources are processed to produce diesel and petrol and so on. And then you have to transport it to where it will be used. And then it's used and eventually there may be some uh, some end products that you need to take care of and the, and the energy system is all that mm. plus the legal and uh, and so on uh, re the regulations in different countries mm. in different regions transnational regions maybe r rules and regulations for how it is taxed how it is uh, banned mm. uh, maybe by uh, additional costs for bad energy mm. and uh, um, some uh, m maybe some advantages if you use clean or green mm. energy. Mm. So, what so about that's, a, that's the energy system. It's yeah. a, a si and of course the energy system underlies the total economy of, of the globe. Yeah. E everything that we do, everything that we produce everything we do in our free time and so on. Mm. So what about other sectors? This is then the dominating sector and other sectors are not as important or equally important? Y you mean other sectors on, on, on the earth? Yeah, I'm thinking about... Yes. Um, energy is by far the most important. The, the connection between climate and uh, the energy system it's very very tight and mm. very very strong mm. um, there are of course some uh, some other sectors but uh, they, they are small by comparison mm. okay so i'm thinking then uh, i mean what can we do consume less energy is was included in those seven bullet points mm -hmm. but we cannot stop consuming energy because society is sort of constructed that way that we're very energy dependent. Mm. So what can we do? What we can do if we cannot uh, eliminate or reduce the energy consumption, we have to replace it instead. We have to replace the energy consumption that is dependent on fossils mm. to, to sources that are not producing greenhouse gases that are not producing global warming. And we know ma many of them, uh, and many of them are already in operation, but at relatively small scales. Mm -hmm. So wind energy, for example, uh, is clean or is uh, greenhouse uh, ad advantageous. Mm -hmm because it doesn't use any fossil fuels except in the production of the windmills. Mm. Uh, the other example, maybe the most important in the long run, is solar energy. Solar energy can be heat, but uh, especially focusing on solar energy as the source for electricity. Mm. It's a dramatic change if we, if we replaced all carbon or natural gas fired uh, power stations uh, with solar energy from uh, silicon solar cells or other solar cells. It would mean 
cutting the 80% dependence to a much lower number. Okay. And that's the goal. It will take a long time. It will be talking about decades. Mm. But, but in terms of abundance, uh, the amount of solar radiation to the globe mm. is so large that it by far exceeds what we need to replace all energy. Mm. One very often talks about 0.01% of the total solar radiation. Is one what in, we need. W- one in 10,000 of the total. Yeah. If we could harvest that, you could replace all energy on Earth. Wow, that, that's uh, impressive. And does that go uh, for, I mean, even for like Scandinavia, for example, <coughs> where we don't have so much sun? Uh, it's not unimportant for Scandinavia, but I, I would say that the, the big picture is still that one should look at the globe and uh, the globe has a lot of deserts, mm. which are advantageous also from a weather point of view. Mm. There are very seldom clouds. So to build a global system of uh, solar electricity, you should imagine that you had power state. We're talking about the long term perspective. You should imagine that you have electricity power stations from solar cells in the major deserts like Arizona, Australian deserts, Gobi deserts. And that would ha- that are connected in a global electricity net. Yeah, okay. And that would have the additional advantage that uh, if you have one power station at one place, it loses its productivity at night. Mm. But if you have a network of global stations that are connected, mm. you can always uh, export. Or, or transport from one region to the other. So that will secure a constant supply. Your co- constant supply, but the supply comes from different places depending on the time of the day or night. Mm. So I'm also thinking about uh, sustainable versus renewable energy sources. Mm-hmm. Uh, and also, I mean, fossil free, sustainable, renewable. These are three mm-hmm. concepts mm-hmm. that we hear a lot. Th- they are, of course, uh, partly sy- synonymous. Mm. But uh, sustainable has a lot of uh, other things built into it. Sustainable means that all the, all the materials, all the processes that are built into producing the say the energy system components should be sustainable from other points of view like from environmental point of view mm-hmm. from uh, access from conflict point of view so sustainable is in a sense broader mm-hmm. renewable means that the energy is uh, is a flowing energy where you uh, if you produce energy, you don't, uh, li- like when you harvest carbon from a c- coal mine, you know that it's not renewable. There is no more carbon mm. on, on reasonable time scale. No right. more carbon is produced. It's emptied. Mm. So it's not renewable. Mm. Wind is renewable because the wind blows and it will blow again tomorrow and so on. Mm. And the same with solar. Mm and uh, to to mention one additional which we haven't talked about like biomass biomass is uh, a source of energy uh, that is regarded as renewable mm. uh, and is regarded as renewable because if you harvest the uh, energy forest you can grow a new forest on the same place so it's a continuous r- renew renewable energy source mm-hmm. when you discuss biomass you very often uh, also touch upon the question that biomass is a lot of carbon mm-hmm. and when you burn carbon you get carbon dioxide so wh- why is that sustainable why is that uh, renewable and it is of course that when the biomass is formed 
it binds CO2 through the photosynthesis process. Yeah. So it's um, <coughs> trapping CO2 and re then releasing, trapping, releasing, trapping, releasing. So the uh, same CO2 going back and forth. So basically. when it comes into some kind of steady state, it's net zero yeah. supply. Which relates to one of the bullet points in the to-do list, which was the plant a garden. Yeah, that's right. Because so you will plant trap a garden, some plant a tree, and plant so a tree. On. Yeah, uh, and fossil free, uh, that could be um, uh, nuclear. Would that be could, would nu be nuclear is of course <coughs> in, in in the discussion. One very often runs into a a debate when one brings up nuclear. Should nuclear be regarded as uh, renewable mm -hmm. or not? And uh, the, the debate goes on. There are camps, mm -hmm. different camps. Uh, the, the original, let's say, the or environmental uh, camp do doesn't like to call it a renewable energy source because it, it is loaded with other things that are uh, considered bad risk for mm. war, risk for accidents, mm. radiation damage and yeah. so on. But strictly from the point of view of the energy system, it is actually relatively, um, re relatively low CO2 source. Yeah, which yeah. is why someone could be pro right, nuclear. Right. So to take Sweden as an example, about half of our electricity mm. comes from nuclear mm. and uh, the other half essentially comes from hydroelectric. hydroelectric yeah. So we have no CO2 or very little CO2 uh, emissions from our electricity production. Mm. And so how does uh, all this relate to surface science? It relates to surface science because surface science is, um, uh, in a way, an enabling technology in many, many areas. Mm. <coughs> As we have discussed before, uh, so surfaces are functional in, uh, for example, in batteries. They are functional in fuel cells. Mm. And batteries uh, is something you need for storage of the uh, solar and the wind. Exactly. The batteries for storage and fuel cells to you for example if you produce hydrogen mm. or even methanol mm. to convert the chemical energy into electricity mm. so uh, these are just a few examples surfaces are important for uh, optical components mm. so surfaces can be tailored to have special optical properties mm -hmm. and that is of course important for solar cells mm -hmm. and and so on right. so surfaces come into construction materials for example one problem with uh, windmills is icing mm -hmm. to have surfaces that de-ice and de-icing of surfaces is a typical surface science problem mm -hmm. and you can make this list uh, almost endless mm -hmm. Um, I'm also thinking about the uh, CCS that uh, you can describe a bit more that is also related to surface science, right? Carbon capture and storage. Yes, carbon capture and storage has been, <coughs> been on the agenda for quite a number of years now. And the basic idea, basic reasoning is the following. If we're going to replace 80% of our energy supply, the 80% that comes from fossil fuels, by other means, it will be a very, very tough challenge. And why do we want to reduce this 80%? It is because every time we use coal, oil, or natural gas, we also emit CO2. Yeah. But if we don't emit CO2, it would maybe be okay. Yeah, right. So if we could, at the exhaust pipeline, mm -hmm. exhaust of a power station that is fired by natural gas, mm -hmm. or from a car, 
if we could trap all the CO2 mm. and not emit it into the atmosphere, maybe it could be okay. Mm. And the concept has been called carbon capture and storage. And especially for large electricity producing units, it's a, it's a viable, technically definitely viable, and economically viable if the energy prices are high enough. Mm. So there are both small scale and large scale uh, experiments going on. The, the very large scale, uh, because these are enormous amounts of CO2, mm. the very large scale uh, experiments build on the idea that you, co you collect uh, CO2 at the exhaust from a power station in, in some form. Mm. It could be just in gaseous form, so you compress it mm. into pressurized CO2. And then you transport it to empty oil wells or empty natural gas wells okay. and pump it down. Yeah. So basically, by using the fossil fuel, you, you create storage places. Right. And you capture the CO2 and you, you, you trap it there. Mm. It, the approach is not uh, received without criticism. The, there is uh, worries that these oil wells or natural gas wells may actually leak out in the future. There may be... <coughs> Uh, earthquakes, there may be other changes that they leak out, but in principle the, the, the basic hurdle yet is the cost. Mm. And uh, if energy, so, so one could say there is a race here between uh, true uh, renewable, mm. like uh, solar energy, like uh, wind energy and so on, or the fossil, mm. but with carbon capture and storage is yes. So this is more like we would go one or the other direction. It's not like we could do this while we are moving towards. I, I think it could very, very much be a, a transition period mm. that wi while we are uh, reforming our energy system to a true sustainable to a true renewable, renewable energy system we may have to to use some of the fossil mm. and by reducing the damage for the climate we could use CCS carbon yeah. capture and storage but this is not yet implemented anywhere it's, In, just it's not implemented as a large scale uh, a, a, a note here is that <coughs> If we if we co collect all the carbon dioxide from from a, a gas gas fired power station, um, we basically reduce the emissions to zero. Mm -hmm. But if we if we apply exactly the same carbon capture and storage system on a fire station on an electricity power station that was uh, fired by biomass, mm -hmm. we could actually have a net negative. Right. Yeah, okay. So we could capture something that wouldn't, wouldn't change the balance uh, bi biomass because biomass, as we talked about before, mm -hmm. the CO2 is fixated mm -hmm. through, the, uh, through the photosynthesis. Mm -hmm. But if we now collect CO2 from biomass, mm. we actually have a, a net reduction of CO2. Mm. And there are, maybe one could call them science fiction, but uh, they are not totally unrealistic. There are ideas to have collection units standing everywhere out in the, in, in the landscape. Mm -hmm that collect CO2. And yeah, because that was a question I had. Do you have to capture it when mm. it's being produced or could you capture yeah. it just in general? You, you could capture it just in general, but from a concentration point of view, of course, at a gas-fired, uh, natural gas-fired power station, the concentration at the outlet is enormously much higher than yeah. it is in the average air that you breathe. Mm. So... It's, it seems that the 
CCS at, at the outlet of uh, CO2 producing units, mm. which could also be other units, production units for steel and so on. Mm. But by, by capturing it there where the concentration is high, mm. seems more feasible. Mm. And so how does this relate to surface science? Because there is a surface <coughs> involved here. Right? The carbon capture and storage yeah, is yeah. a very good example where surface science comes in. Surface science has, for example, been, which I forgot to mention, a very important science for catalysis. Catalysis is the conversion of chemicals on surfaces that consist of very small part, very often very small particles, so-called heterogeneous catalysis. Mm -hmm. and, and it's an advanced surface science problem to perform catalysis like uh, in car, car emission cleaning, but also in production of chemicals like uh, ammonia for fertilizing mm. and so on. So in, in the context of carbon capture and storage, you need a filter that collects CO2, that binds CO2, traps CO2, mm. but allow nitrogen and oxygen and uh, water vapor mm -hmm. to go out through the, the exhaust pipe. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, the surfaces that have surfaces that have such selectivity to only collect CO2 and not the other gases is a very typical surface science problem mm. to design the chemical properties of the surface mm. such that it interacts with carbon dioxide only only uh, and and binds CO2 mm. at the actual temperatures mm. so we have a lot of surface science here then both for uh, design of new renewable uh, energy production sources, you mm -hmm. mentioned the solar, for example, mm -hmm. and then to store mm -hmm. this energy mm -hmm. in terms of batteries and then also in terms of capturing carbon dioxide, which is already released or is right, being released. Right. And also to use fuels yeah. through catalysis. Right. So uh, a very important uh, scientific area. Mm -hmm. um, so if we are Right, I'm also thinking about climate effect versus environmental effects. This is something that we haven't mm -hmm. really discussed. Because mm -hmm. one of the bullet points said, eat locally grown foods and organic. And I'm thinking organic may is not necessarily um, uh, like climate, good for the climate, or is it? Mm -hmm. Is organic, mm -hmm. uh, what is the relation between, uh, between the, these two? Concepts. You mean between environmental effects and... Uh, and organic. Uh, or, in, or, yeah, environmental or effects and... And uh, climate. And climate, and yes. Climate. Yeah. As, as we talked about in the beginning, climate is the change of conditions over long time scales. Temperature, wind, uh, uh, sea level, and so on. That is a consequence of temperature changes. Mm -hmm. So there, the focus on climate is on these large-scale, long-term changes. Environmental <coughs> changes can occur as a consequence of the climate changes, but there are, of course, also other environmental changes that have nothing to do or very little to do with climate. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so, for example, when, when we harvest uh, minerals from mines, we can cause enormous uh, poisonous deposits in rivers, in lakes, and so on. Mm. These are environmental, mm. uh, in environmentally bad, but they are, from a climate point of view, essentially r r no effect. Right, that's true. So if you're going for and there are ma many such examples where the environmental effects are dramatic on the local environment on mm. the ecosystem mm -hmm. but the climate effect or climate effects are essentially absent yeah so mm -hmm. it could be a situation where you are damaging the environment but it's improving the it could even be yeah to the extent that there is a conflict of interest between the environmental effects and the climate effects yeah 
Um, hmm. Okay, so if we are to summarize this, um, who can and should act on this? Yes, who can and should act. Uh, I would say that uh, the, the action has to come at every level of society. So at, at the top level or bottom level, however you see it, the individual. Mm. You, you mentioned the seven point list. Mm. So individuals can affect CO2 emissions by measuring their CO2 footprints how much they travel, how many air travels they make every year, how you travel to work, uh, what kind of food mm. that you consume, mm. and, and so on. But th the whole system w would never be radically changed if there were not in parallel uh, big uh, efforts at the other end of the spectrum, mm. not the individual, but trans national mm. or international and regional and national levels mm. so all these levels has have to interact in some kind of a feedback loops for example a nation a, a country can give in incentives to its citizens by making it economically advantage advantageous to use uh, greenhouse free energy mm. uh, and to offer infrastructures that are uh, free from g greenhouse gases and so on mm. by supporting industrial production that uh, is environment is uh, climate mm. advantageous mm. like like in Sweden just to take a concrete example, w one industry sector that produces a lot of CO2 is uh, steel production from iron ore. Mm. And the reason is that iron exists as iron oxide and the iron oxide has to be reduced. Mm. And one efficient way, used way to reduce the oxygen from the iron oxide is to use carbon monoxide or methane but then you produce CO2 in the exhaust from the production unit now a very good reducing agent is hydrogen so by replacing carbon containing reducing gases like methane or CO by hydrogen the emission will be water and right. it will be CO2 free right so there is a large-scale uh, project in Sweden to implement this. Okay. It's known that it's becoming more expensive mm. but as long as the expense can be covered by market prices or, or can mm. meet market prices is still a viable way to go and it's a good example of a non primarily a non-energy system component. It's, it's more like an industrial production component. Mm. Where, where one tries to reduce the CO2 emission. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Mm -hmm. So I as a consumer, I can then uh, try to consume maybe less energy and the energy that I consume can should be from a good source, so to say. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. then there has to be a bigger initiative at a higher level right. to make sure that we implement renewable energy sources. To give incentives, to give, to uh, give incentives. economic incentives, of course, are very important. Mm -hmm. And uh, transnational agreements, of course. The, but it's, it's, a very, it's a very complicated system because uh, a country that depends that it decides to go ahead and be a, a forerunner by implementing reduce reduce CO2 emissions from industrial production from traveling and so on also uh, seems to or, or are suspected to get an economic disadvantage mm. in, in competition on the market mm. uh, global market and therefore it uh, retards it, it slows down the development. Mm. So it's a balance act and it's a, 
what I sometimes call the terror of progress by small steps. <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay, I think we will end with those words. Yeah. Okay. Um, so um, this was a good introduction to climate change and how this relates to the energy system. Mm -hmm. And we also learned about uh, the relevance of surface science in this context. Uh, so that's all we had for today. So thank you for listening to this episode of Surface Science, uh, a bigger perspective on the small. Uh, with me, Malin Edvarsson, and uh, Professor Bengt Kasimo, uh, Professor of Physics at Chalmers University of Technology. Thank you very much. Thank you.